Hi, um, my name is Matt Woodward. Um, I'm a game designer at CCP. I work on EVE Online. I graduated from university and I did a philosophy degree in the UK, and then I pretty much just moved over here and started working at CCP. I've been here for like four and a half years now. I'm doing game design the whole time, so I've got a reasonable amount of experience. Um, today I'm going to be talking about game design and ideas and how that all fits together. Um, before I start, there's one like point I wanted to slip in at the beginning, which was that everybody in the history of human history, apart from possibly mathematicians, are wrong about everything. Um, don't take anything I say as like authority. This is my opinions and this is experience behind this. But like, like if you look at like Isaac Newton, like he was pretty much right about gravity and got us to the moon. But Einstein says not really. He was kind of right about ether. Okay, he wasn't really right about ether, but it got us somewhere. It was a nice building block. And he was very wrong about mercury. Um, don't don't go for the mercury thing. Aim for the for the theory of gravity or whatever. But you know, if you can get in the middle, hit ether. You build something, you work off it, it's good. Always be thinking, always be analysing, thinking, why is this guy wrong? Why is this person wrong? Can I do better than this? That's kind of the mindset that I think you should go into things with. So, yeah, just, just don't take what I'm saying for granted. Pick it apart if you can. On with the show. Um, things I'm going to talk about today. Um, why all ideas are worthless. Um, how you find a good idea. How you turn a good idea into a good design. And how you turn a good design into a good game. Starting with this one, which is nice and controversial. Um, all ideas are completely worthless. It's kind of, it's true, but it's also kind of misleading. Um, an idea in and of itself, A, has no monetary value, because most people won't pay you for an idea, unless you've got like a patent, and that's just weird. Um, and B, an idea, unless you're like a really nerdy game designer, an idea for a game that's not filling with joy, does not make you feel highly oh, entertained. It's like, that's lovely, but where's the game? Um, so the idea itself, um, not such a big deal, um, but also at the same time really, really important. Um, you can make a good game off a bad idea. It's easy to make a good game off a good idea. It's also really easy to make a bad game based on a good idea. The idea is important, but it's not absolutely critical, and it's not based by no means the whole thing. The idea is just like the egg. If you want a chicken, you have to have the egg, and a good egg is a good place to start. But you have to hatch it and raise it and rear it and feed it and make it into an actual chicken. Um, it's not a great analogy. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's that kind of... People often get too hung up on the idea, I've got a great idea and that's lovely, but you need to take it places. Um, another important thing is that, like, there's a really big skill that designers have for regarding ideas, and it's not having ideas. You don't need to be a world-class designer, you don't need to have a single original idea. It's really helpful. Um, but the key skill for a designer is being able to tell the good ideas and the bad ideas. Like the way we do it at CCP these days is, like, when we're doing very narrow problems, we usually solve it within the design department. But as soon as we have big, open questions like, what should we do? What kind of approach would be good here? We get as many people in as possible from all over the company. Like, we get publishing, we get marketing, we get customer support, we get the kitchen staff that they'll come. And we say, just throw as many ideas as the whiteboard as you can. We write post notes and you get, like, 500 ideas that week, and the designer skill is being able to go to that huge stack of posters and go crap, 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 good, doing that one, crap, crap, and just filtering it out. And that's the thing that you really need to be able to hit is like, that's a good idea, that's a bad idea. And if you can do that, then your ideas front is pretty much sorted. You can, anyone can have a good idea, but not many people know which ones are good and which ones are bad. And that's the thing you kind of want to hit off on. Um, uh, slight digression. Um, common thing with a lot of people who are kind of thinking about getting into games. Having just it just started, people are worried about people stealing their ideas. Um, this isn't something you really need to worry about, um, <coughs> mainly because most people who work in computer games have like a watch of game ideas of their own, and very few people, especially at the, like the big game scale, ever get a chance to do that. If you're working more at a small scale, the indie stuff, the stuff I guess you guys are doing, you probably all got a chance to make your small scale game idea, and that's a real opportunity and take it. But if you're talking about like a Grand Theft Auto style thing. There's going to be a couple of hundred people this set this decade who are going to get to make their game, and if you tell most people in the game industry, make any game you like, they're not going to go for yours. They're going to go for their game because they've got a watch of 50 and they want to pick one of those. So like, it's it's really not as big a deal as people worry about. They're like, oh dear, people will steal my stuff. People have their own ideas, they'll use theirs. Um, be chill about it. It's cool. Talk about your ideas, share your ideas, be generous with your ideas. 
And if you bounce them off people, then they'll usually tell you how to make it better, or they'll give you an idea that you can make it better. So just, yes, don't let that worry you too much. Um, why is that black? That slide is not black. There we go. That's a much better slide. Um, yeah, so like, what is a good idea? Um, so this is an important skill, it's also one of the kind of voodoo bits of game design where it's kind of hard to really pin down like, like a list of people, like a, a formula for a good idea. But there's like three basic things I'd be looking for. Uh, one, kind of is it functional? Does it do what you want to do in this game? If it's the idea for the whole game, is it the kind of game you want to make? If it's an idea for part of the game, does it fit in with the game you want to make? Is it is it right? Does it fit the tone? Does it, does it fit with the kind of players you want to be playing in? Um, does it have any obvious problems? If you can see like glaring holes, oh, if we do this, then like the whole game breaks or whatever, then you probably want to skip it. Um, so that's kind of the first thing I want to check. Is, is this a, a functional idea? The second thing, is this idea feasible? Um, one of the big challenges, probably the biggest challenge of game development is planning and scheduling. Um, the game development industry is terrible at this. Um, so it's something that the skill you want to develop early, like always looking at like, is this going to fit in my, in my schedule? We've got three weeks. Is this like a great idea that's going to take two days or an okay idea that's going to take two and a half weeks? If the latter, you probably want to skip that. Um, and the same person is it technically feasible? Does it fit in our code base? Does, does what we're using to make the game even support this? Um, this again, it's easy to just knock it out of the park if it doesn't work. Uh, the third point is, is it good, which is the tricky bit. Um, yeah, and this, this is the one that's kind of hard to, to just tell you how to do it. Um, the kind of the question you want to be asking for everything you're working on is, does this make my game better? How much better does it make my game? And is it worth the effort? Um, and this line is always like, if it's, a, if it's good in this sense, it's like, this is making my game better and it's worth the time. Um, and yeah, I could ramble, ramble about this for a long time, but it's just, this is the, the thing that you kind of need to learn through experience to a large degree, I think. The kind of the maybe the one starting point I'd, I'd mention is like a lot of game design ended up about big modeling in your head, particularly trying to look at something and say, How is this going to work out? and trying to envision if I put this in my game, what will my game look like? And if you can get that into your head, you can look at an idea and you can slot it into the game in your head and go, no, that's not good, or yes, that's good, or I like the way that looks like it's going. You won't always be right about that, but it's just a, it's a sense that you can build up with experience of like, this is good, this is not so good. Um, yeah, good ideas, important. Yeah, okay, give me a question here. Yeah, this one. Um, could you give us an example, if you can, about a bad game and, uh, design idea that you said in the scrap? Um, hmm, I'm sure I can, but I can think of one. I'm really bad with examples, this is my weak point in talking. <laughs> Example of a bad game idea that we've put in anyway. Um, everything I did in the first year of my game. Um, <laughs> yeah, jump bridges. Jump bridges are terrible idea. <laughs> we thought, let's make it easier for people to move around, and then we kind of forgot that moving around is like a big part of what makes hauling things and makes defense and attack and everything really like interesting and important because you've got to consider your travel times and you kind of everyone's travel times by a factor of 10. Um, that was done. <laughs> it's that kind of thing, we just, we just, I mean, it was my first expansion and I hadn't really done a lot of game design and I hadn't really thought about it. I was like, yeah, this would be really cool, the players will love this. And then we kind of looked back like two years later and went, no, we could have done that. <laughs> and then we should have known now what I knew then, but, or knew then what I knew now. But yeah, that kind of thing happens, it's just, just usually just not looking far enough ahead and not appreciating the full consequences of what you're trying to do. And then it bites you in the ass. This happens. It's a, it's a learning experience. You learn some experience and go, let's not do that next time. Um, hopefully. Yes. Um, well, if you have a good idea, um, the next step is to turn that into a good design. Um, it's not just like the idea itself is not only that the, the idea is worthless, but until you make it something that you can share with people, it's not even helpful. Um, and this applies to all scales, it applies to like, your master grand vision of the whole thing and it applies to each little feature. You need a way to communicate it, which is what your design is. Uh, when you're working in your design, the first thing I would recommend really is talking to your team as much as possible. Um, I'm assuming for most of this presentation that 
you're the designer and you've got a team of programmers and sound guys and artists and so on, it's quite possible that a lot of you are filling multiple hats in what you're doing, in which case just kind of, you know, split those apart and understand that you're talking to yourself sometimes. Um, yeah, key point about uh, your game design, which classically at least tends to be a written document, is make sure you understand who you're writing for and make sure you're giving them what they want. Um, like, I think that as a designer, like a designer, in one of these things where I'm split from the other departments, that you realise quickly is that programmers don't read a lot. Um, that's not meant to sound like mean or anything, but like if you write a wall of text, most programmers will go, huh, no, and just like pick the bits. It's it's not because they're bad people or anything. It's just because when you confront with this big wall and you don't know where to start, and especially if your design isn't wonderfully written and it's not clear exactly how it fits together, it, it people miss things, um, and often you can be giving them too much or too little detail and. Like it's 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 just it's not a good design. Okay, it might still work, but it's not good if if the people who are using it, your customers effectively on your team, can't look at it and go, oh, I see what I need to do here. Um, you want this to be obvious. Um, so the first thing to say is talk to your team and ask them what they want from your design. Um, we've had some programmers who want a bullet list of everything ever. The entire spec needs to be written out. They will just go and fill it in. But a lot of programmers come. If you're working in games, they're working with you because they want to make computer games. They want to have an input. They want to have some like creative freedom to implement stuff. Um, it's important for your design usually that there are things that you need to hit. It needs to be this. These big things need to be the case, and these little things that look unimportant, they're really important too. So what we tend to do is we lay them out, and then we say the rest of it. Like talk to us if you've got any like you want more info, but this bit here, make it good, make it fit these basic criteria. Um, Beyond that, just you know, fill in the blanks. Uh, a lot of our programmers at CCP at least are already happy to do that. Um, did a thing a couple of years ago with a new scanning system where I just let the programmer, who's a really good math guy, just just like make that formula good. And he spent like three days on a whiteboard just tidying it all up and it worked beautifully. And I, was, I don't understand it, but it's it, it did exactly what I wanted it to do. So that was that was good. Um, yeah, yeah, just make sure that make sure that. What you're setting down to write out and deliver is is what the people who are taking that and turning it into a game actually want to read because that's a, like a massive efficiency game if you can do that. Once you know what you want, um, time to make the design, um, which is generally a lot of writing, a lot of words. Um, the few I minutes mean, is like the basics of this are just the same as the basics of good writing. Use as few words as possible. Be as clear as possible. Um, you know, communicate well. Uh, if you can put other media in, if you can get pictures and the pictures are great. You know, it's just what I do when I just make a screenshot and throw it in a nice paint and just draw big red lines everywhere. That's the visual thing is easier to explain. If you can get videos and stuff, sure. Um, prototyping, if you can get a prototype and show them like this is how it works and they can play with it. The documentation is good as well. Prototype, I mean, it's standard industry advice, you know, prototype everything and it's true because it works. Um, the more you can prototype, the better. Um, and yeah, just make sure that it's say it's clear and it's communicating. In terms of the actual content, which is where kind of the design skill comes in, what people think of the design skill. Um, basically, what you're doing in the design is you're trying to solve all the problems or catch them, and solve the problems in your head before they get into the code. Because fixing things in your head is easy. You go, that's broken. What if I did this? And then you model it in your head and you go, that should work. They get into code and it's like, they spend a week implementing it and it's like, well that doesn't work, that's, that's, the design's broken there. Okay, throw that week of code out and do it again, and that's just, it's expensive and slow and we don't want it, so. Whatever ways you can find to, to model it and visualize it, I find drawing big, messy, like, flow diagrams on whiteboards really helpful. Again, prototyping helps, talking to people often helps, and this is, even just writing stuff down, this is like a common thing, I think, it's easy to have something in your head and you think, I understand how this works intuitively. It makes perfect sense to me, I can explain this easily. When you try to write it down, you try to just explain to someone, you go, you hear like a stomach block and you go, actually, I don't know how that bit works. And just the act of the act of commitment to something, words or paper, or whatever, helps you clarify for yourself what you mean. So yeah, the whole kind of the idea of any design doc you're making is to and the design work you're doing for it is to is to find out the all the kinks and find them in your head cheaply before they get expensive in the code. Um, 
once you have a good design, that's super, but that's not a good game yet. And the designer's job definitely does not stop when they finish writing the design. Um, because, I mean, you can do it that way, but it's not going to get you what you want in most cases. Um, you have to make sure that what you've got in the document actually gets into the game um, in collaboration with your team. Which again means talking to your team again. It's, this is, your communication skills are a pretty big deal for a designer. Um, because you have to get things in your head to enter the computer. And if you're not a programmer as well, then it has to go through another person. So, um, one of the things that turns out not to work so well usually, and it kind of alludes back to what I was talking about earlier with people not reading stuff so much, if it's a big wall of text, is if you just hand the document off and you say, make that happen, that has a variable success ratio, should we say. Um, much better is if you can make sure that everyone understands what you're trying to do before they start work, because again, fixing it in the code is expensive. Um, a nice trick I've found is, I mean, you should be doing tech checks the whole way through your design, making sure that what you're doing is still feasible and you've not added some little thing that's like six weeks work. Um, the good thing to do at the end, once you're reasonably happy, is to sit everyone down and do some estimation. Um, and again, it ties back into planning being important and everyone being terrible about it. Um, if you sit down with your team and you go through the whole doc and you say, how long will this bit take? How long will this bit take? And we can just go like one day, two days, five days. It means that everyone's reading, everyone's engaged, because everyone's thinking, do I understand this enough to give an estimate? And the engagement is the talking as well. It's not just, if you sit down and you read your design to someone, they're going to switch off because unless you're like the world's best public speaker, it's going to get kind of monotonous. If you're going like, if you're having a conversation, it's like, how does this look? How does this look? How long will this take? Um, should we cut this? They're like, this, this, this little thing here, how long will that take? They're like, six months. They're like, no. Um, that's gone. Just, just, it's a good process to do that. And it's good to get everyone on the same page. Everyone understands what's going on. They catch the small bits that kind of bite you in the ass. Um, and once you actually go into, into production and you actually start making stuff, um, keep talking to your team. Um, as much as you can. A uh, little thing that we ended up doing is we moved to Scrum and some of the production process, etc. Cetera, et cetera, but we ended up putting everyone sitting together in teams. So you have like designers and programmers and QA and artists in, a, in, a, in like a corner of the office together working on a particular thing. And one of the really big wins out of this is that when a programmer hits a thing and they're not quite sure what they should be doing, they can go, Matt, how does this work? And I can go, do it like that. And they can we have like a 30 second chat. And the programmers not have to like pick up a messaging client and type me and wait for me to get back. They don't have to get up and leave the desk and wander off and like get a coffee and talk to me. It's just like they're in the work and they're just like, how does this do? Yeah, that's lovely. And that kind of just like a big part of when you get really into design, you'll find that user experience is a really big deal. And this is essentially the user experience of the rest of your team. It's finding ways like the little things that don't look like a big deal but that just really optimize the flow of everything. So if you can find a way when you're when you've got people working away, you just, as a designer can just be hanging around somewhere doing something unobtrusive. When they hit a snag, they can talk to you and they can say, I'm going to fix it like this. Is that cool? Yeah. No, no, it's done. And there's no, no interruption and the fingers are on the keyboard. And it's just smoothing everything out. Uh, I think really contributes to making a good, a good game. And then the other standard bit of industry advice that everybody ever will give you, because um, they're right, is iterate and play testing. Um, Everybody does this. Well, no, that's not true at all. Um, everybody who's good does this. Um, like, every time something's done and ready in the code or ready in the art, whatever, the user design, whatever, without being domineering, without looking like you're like, second guessing everybody and trying to micromanage in hard work, check it out. See what they've done, see if it's good, see if you can see anything to improve. Um, you know, make notes, make adjustments if you need to. Um, and, on this kind of topic, make sure that it's really useful if you can get your whole team to understand that this is how good games are made. Um, sometimes stuff gets through. Even, even though we try to fix things in design, nobody gets it right first time. No one on the planet, like even the very best, like top tier designers, like Miyamoto and Will Wright and that kind of level of people, iterate on their work all the time. Um, places like Valve and Bungie have massive test labs where they get people in there every week for like a year and a half to run their game and they monitor and they check their heart rate and stuff. You don't need to deal with that stuff, but everybody goes, it won't be good first time. 
we need to get it better. And if your team goes into it knowing this and being like, we know that some of this stuff is going to change, then you're probably in a good place. It can get rocky when people think they're just going to knock it out of the park the first time. You go, no, we need to go out and do this again. It, it, if it comes as a surprise to people, then they tend to be less accepting of that. So if you can get people into that mindset of like, we're going to have to keep tweaking. And we're going to have to keep, if we want to make a really good game, we have to keep reacting to what we've got. And having this little feedback loop of try it, see if it's good, change it, try it again. Um, and yeah, and just keep looking at it and keep, keep doing whatever you can to be involved in the project. I mean, again, if you're, if you're all designer programmers and designer artists and stuff, then that's not an issue. If you've got standalone designers, then don't kind of let yourself drift away towards the end. Stay involved, even if you're just testing stuff. I mean, if you're, you know, moonlighting as an extra QA and just, just like testing the game constantly, looking for bugs. It keeps you in the loop, it keeps you engaged, and it makes sure you've got more eyes on the project, making sure the project's as good as it can be, which is kind of what you want to do. Um, so yeah, summary. Um, ideas aren't worth anything, but they're really important. Um, anyone can have a good idea, that's a really important point. The designer's skill is to know which ones are good and which ones are bad. Um, a good design communicates well, and it delivers to the team what they need to make the game. And the design's work is never done until the lights go off. Um, you should always be involved, you should always be playtesting, iterating, and, and doing whatever you can to make the game as good as possible. And that's what we have. Um, Craig says, welcome to CCP. He's been in the industry for over 50 years or something. Yeah, it's not my own. And um, yeah, we want to put that away a lot of time for a question and answer. So, um, good questions. As a game designer, uh, I imagine uh, everyone has some inputs mm -hmm. and ideas. Yes. So, like an artist or a programmer, are they considered to be designers also, or, or you know, is it? Uh, are you the <laughs> boss of designers? This is actually one of the big, big awkward issues of game design. Everyone, everyone thinks they're game designer. Everyone's remotely interested in games thinks they're game designer. Um, lots of people involved in games have different levels of design skill. Everyone can have a good idea, and there's some people who, like, for instance, are a programmer, but are also an amazing designer, or a really good designer, or a pretty good designer, or whatever. Um, I always encourage people to get as much input from as much of their team as possible, give everybody as much creative ownership as possible, but you also kind of, if you are the official designer, at least, like we have a, we're a design department, we kind of are in charge. It, if you know what you're doing more than they do, then you probably want to make sure that when there's a disagreement, things are going more your way than their way as much as you can do while keeping the team together. Um, and that's kind of going to be a balancing act, I think, on a case-by-case -case basis, exactly how you deal with that. And part of it is sometimes, I suspect, letting things slide a little bit, because it's better for the team that people feel like that they're being listened to and they're involved, even if it's like, I could have done it slightly better, but it's not that important, we'll do it your way, that's fine. Um, so yeah, like there's, and there's, there's varying degrees, like just, there's, Designers are going to be the skill, technical skill, artistic skill. And I didn't even want to make as much use as possible about the skills. But you also, yeah, depending on how projects set up, it's something that's to have tiebreakers effectively. Like I said, I'm, I'm writing your watch. Yes? So you have your team, you have artists, programmers, uh, designers, and whatever. Uh, when do uh, the people writing the narrative uh, come into your team? Um, good question, yes. Um, asking with all these multi discipline teams where the writers fit in. Um, as soon as possible, generally. Um, I mean, because we're making Eve and the kind of the, the fiction's already pretty much set, we don't have the issue that other studios do where they're writing, a, they're making a new thing from scratch, a new story from scratch. In those cases, I think there's a general consensus among the creative side of the industry that writers should be involved earlier, but um, as I understand it, there are various budgetary and etc. constraints that mean that doesn't always happen. You really, if, you're, if you're doing writing, if any part of your game is resting on, on writing or story, then you should really get a professional to do it for you. Um, there's, there's, there's lots of people in the industry with, with writing skills, and most designers should have decent writing skills, it's kind of important, but 
most of them are not professional writers and shouldn't be assuming they are because writing is easy, especially if you're a game designer and you've lived your whole life and you're going, oh, design's easy, it's just having ideas. Um, don't treat writers the same way. It's not as like, oh, writing's easy, I just put words down. No, please don't do that if you can help it. Um, for what we do, it's, it's, we have a team of writers, like three or four professional writers in house. When we need words, when we have story stuff we want doing, we talk to them as soon as possible. There's too few of them to have them on the teams because there's only like three or four in the office and we've got like half a dozen teams. Um, some teams get them, some teams don't, some teams we just like have a dependency. We say, we need Nick for two weeks to write a whole lot of text. But yeah, the main, the main, the main takeaway would be just like professional writers, professional writers because they're actually good at it and don't do that lightly because writing is not easy. Good writing at least. So do they all have the specific writing education? Or? No, I don't think so. Some do, some don't. Um, but there were people who dedicated their professional career to it. In some way, like a lot of game designers don't have like a technical game design education. I certainly did philosophy. Um, but it's something I've been interested in. I've, I've worked hard to be a decent designer, and that's what my profession is, and that's what my career development has been. And I'm by no means claiming I'm particularly good at it um, on the grander scale of things, but. Um, yeah, I, I've worked more than some people who just think, oh, I've got some ideas, I must be right. Um, it's the same kind of deal with writers, like most, like, everyone can write a bit, hopefully, I hope you're all literate. Um, but, like, to be a good writer, you need, you need to put the time in, just at least use the best writers you have and don't assume you can blow them off and do it yourself. So. Answer, I think, wait, but... okay. Check if you want Where do you get, like, most of your ideas? Your reference and stuff for getting some money. Like, what? do you just play them as a game? games or do you like planning? Yeah, yeah. What's your process on like keeping your brain? My process on keeping my brain going and getting ideas and trying to start. Um, playing games is one of them. I play a lot of games. I mean, it's not really surprising. Um, <laughs> play a lot of games um, and then think about those games with my designer hat on. Try and understand how the game works and what I would change and what I would do better and what I would do worse. Um, and just have opinions about everything, be really opinionated. Not like annoyingly opinionated, hopefully. Um, <laughs> but like just try and try and analyse everything. It's not just games, it's like everything you see, just, just question things. How will I think about this? And it's, it's more about keeping your brain running and just exercising your brain. Um, I don't have a specific process for coming up with ideas. Um, I don't know quite how it works. It just you think about something long enough and something pops out. Um, but I think the process of, of just keeping your brain active and just picking at everything you see in the world, um, making those things. Some things are just like you see something and think, oh, that was a, that would be, huh? I could use that for this, or I could just stop part of that. That's a nice idea. Um, I might use that one day. Um, but most of what I find is just yeah, it's just is generally keeping the brain active and then. And then just hoping it comes out. But as I said, a lot of it is I don't rely on myself for ideas as much anymore. I talk to people and we do brain, we do like formal brainstorming with process and just just get as many ideas as possible. Craig, do you have an opinion about this? Uh, yeah, I have a lot of broad range of experience, life experience. Don't just play games. I know it's very, very, very tempting to sit in your home and play games. But go out and experience existence because Inspiration will come at the strangest times. Yeah. Uh, I've got some weird examples that I may tell you at another point, but they're not very uh, office friendly, shall we say. <laughs> yeah. I think also add to that, like any life experience can be turned into something useful. Game design, do stuff that you're interested in. Like as most if you talk to a lot of you about this kind of stuff, there's a tendency to people to think the kind of experience that I had are the kind of experiences you need to be a designer. It's more just that you have to have the right attitude and then any experience you like can set you up. And it'll take you down different paths. It'll take you down like a more systemy path or more narrative path or all kinds of stuff like that. But go for things that you're interested in, that you've, the stuff that you're interested in, get experience with that and then kind of build that back into your, into your professional stuff. So how did you uh, end up at Eve? <laughs> <laughs> I've got the origin story. Um, <laughs> how long should I do this? Should I do the short version or the long version? Short version. 
Um, I was in the volunteer program um, while I was at university um, doing philosophy, which is not really related, but it's kind of, it, in a way it makes your brain think it's kind of useful. And I was just enthusiastic about being working at the volunteer on another game and got involved with some of the developers there and the design is quite a small game. It's a failing game, in fact. Um, I got really interested and then got into the volunteer program for Eve, worked as a, an event actor, like flying space for them for six months. And the job apps came out and I was like, yep, me, I want to do that, pick me, pick me, pick me. And then I got like a couple of tests, and then Elgi was our HDR guy at the time. I remember he said, Matt, um, when did you come to Iceland? And I was like, you want to interview me? He said, no, 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 pack your bags, get on the plane, I'll pick up the airport, we've got accommodation. Like, I was like, okay. <laughs> and then two weeks later, I'm living in the place of the bus station. It's interesting. Um, yeah, it's, it's, there's, I mean, most people don't get hired straight to game design. Um, like, CCP is an odd place, and my story is an odd story. Most people start in QA or something, or they come in through programming or art or some other discipline, and they kind of cross over. I think there's no standardised route in really, which means it's kind of different. Uh, yeah, um, just to add to that, CCP, as Mark says, is an odd place to be a person. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit taller. Um, so CCP is odd when it comes to our design department. Uh, most people are brought from the community or um, you know, just massive E+. Plus. Only recently we've started bringing experienced people from other places at the beginning here. Myself, I've been doing this, as Matt told you, not quite for 15 years, but close. Uh, 13 years I've been in the games industry. Um, you know, if you want to get into game design, there are lots of great courses for it now, and that's a really, really good place to start. Um, but get in at the ground floor, work your way up. If you're good, your ideas will be noticed. You will be noticed and you will be brought into the fold. Um, but it's, you've got to work for it. You know, I started in QA, I gradually worked my way up, uh, and now I'm in Iceland. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay, okay, like one feature of the game, like we <laughs> that, that, yeah, very um, So 
yeah, uh, as I said, it does vary depending on the scope of the idea. Um, it's, it, we work currently in three month release cycles, so to get something into EVE, it will take a minimum of three months. That's the way we work. Uh, we, we change up how our release cycles work, uh, but you know, an idea to completion <coughs> for EVE Online anyway is about three months, because that's our release schedule. And there's certain things, in terms of actually getting it out, there's certain things like when we do a patch, we have to do a week of progression testing, for example, and checking if things still works. And that's the QA on, on the feature itself. So it's pretty difficult, even if we, like, it, in the best possible case, it's going to be at least two or three weeks. Even if it's a small, small <coughs> bit. It's like, you know, two or three days of coding, a couple of days of designing, a um, couple of days of QA. And then there's a, like a, a week buffer of patch testing. And then it goes out. That's the, the short we can do with quotas as normally is like two or three months. We fill stuff to fit the space available effectively. So. That answer thing you want to know. Okay. Is the uh, design process, uh, you know, like, like uh, your job, uh, are you uh, following through the whole time or, or are you just in a specific area of you know, the process where, when you're making a technician or a patch or something? So, like, how long are we involved throughout the whole process yeah. of making things? Yeah. Uh, pretty much how we do. Pre production. Like when the idea, for example, it's going to be we try to have at least the bare bone designs ready to go when the programmers want to start, um, and we're still probably designing ahead of them, like laying down the way else the designers there, chopping up behind the locomotive of coding. That's a really bad metaphor, um, and then checking things as, like I say, like monitoring it, checking things that they checked in, and seeing if it works. And there's often things that need to be set up. We do all the what we call content authoring. Like putting values in databases, making a spaceship, and saying it's got this many shields and this many gun slots and this kind of thing. That all falls on us as well, so we fill out a lot of time with that. And then, if there's any spare time, we get pulled into new testing. We're busy the whole way through. We just we try to stop a little bit before, or at least there's usually release, and then there's a couple of weeks of getting stuff fixed because we don't catch everything. And that period is what we use to prep for the next release, for most part. So it's kind of like continuous. I don't think I cut you off. Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. Anybody else? No, what do you want to say? So if there is anyone here, a group that has already started on a project or is about to start on a project and want to participate in a competition, feel free now to ask Matt and Craig to take a look at your idea and give feedback on what you're working on. Or if you're just getting ideas now, please just ask them and get some feedback from them. Abuse the problem. Do you want to do that in public or do you want to do that in small groups? Or? Yeah, let's just do it in our smaller groups. Just You can just maybe walk between and ask. Yeah. Yeah? yeah okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, thanks. thanks.